Our lives are becoming increasingly virtual. Our stuff is too. Today we call that stuff NFTs, a new creative medium of expression where digital artists collaborate with giants in music and entertainment. Everything from pro sports moments and collectibles to digital clothing paired with real-world physical items. Entire virtual worlds of art and commerce ushering us into this new neon cyberpunk future under three simple letters. We've gathered some of the greatest innovators and originators in this bold new space to get animated with some of the biggest names in music, pop culture, entertainment, and tech. This is NFT All-Stars. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off. Pete Holmes is doing NFTs now. That's pretty exciting. I've been in the space like four years and four years ago, like the idea that well-known celebrities would start to be coming into this space was sort of anathema to me, you know, and super excited to hear how you kind of came into NFTs and learn a little bit more about non-fungible joking and what that's about. I think, Marguerite, you might agree that we could use some more humor in the NFT space. Are you sure? I don't know. I think the NFT space is full of humor. <laughs> too, too much humor, maybe? It's so much humor. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm excited. I'm excited for the professional humor twist. Yeah, I don't know how much we can help you. The consensus with every comedian that did the non-fungible joking show was that we didn't know what the hell was going on. Although the the conceit of it is very... I don't want to be an old weird guy saying punk rock, but I'm going to be an old weird guy saying punk rock. I like the idea of having ownership because being in show business, having, I, I don't just mean for me, but the crew and everybody involved in the non fungible joking show uh, became an owner of the NFT. And that creates a different atmosphere there. It's a different game. Being in show business, I'm used to. You know, nothing wrong with studios and networks. Of course, I have to say that, <laughs> but there's <laughs> nothing wrong with studios and networks. Um, but traditionally, it's not been like a participatory endeavor. It's like you get a fee, you show up, and uh, you basically are part of the meal. You know, you get served on the table and you're consumed and you're happy for the opportunity to be consumed. But anything that's sort of and this might sound like a joke, but Tyler Perry eyes is it, meaning Tyler Perry flipped all that and started buying studios and producing his own stuff. NFT seems more like a reasonable way uh, for artists and other people to get involved in the whole process instead of just being the camera person or just being the, ca uh, the lighting person or just being the comedian. So that was interesting to me, although I'm still not entirely sure, like, this is a non-fungible show. I guess every other show I was doing was fungible and has already been funged. That's all I know. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, um, Pete, what was your entry point into the NFT space? What was your first exposure? I heard, I mean, like a lot of people, I just heard people were buying Pharrell's first tweet or something. And I, I did find it sort of philosophically interesting, meaning all ownership is is a conceit, you know, sort of like, time or money. These are all just sort of agreed upon illusions. They're not really real. So extending that into a digital space wasn't as absurd as it might be for maybe my mom, who really has absolutely no, not only no understanding, but no respect for what's going on. I thought it was a creative approach to ownership and an interesting and creative, again, creative, creative, creative twist on how can we play with the energy of ownership and how can we uh, revitalize it a little bit. Even though obviously the comedy angle is like, I don't get it. What the hell is going on? I don't understand the stock market. I don't understand legal tender. Like it, it's nothing new <laughs> for things to not be understood by me. So if somebody wants to buy a tweet or buy this performance, although I will say this performance being something that you could buy and then air and then profit off of the airing, that makes it a little bit more clear. I don't know what the guy who owns Pharrell's first tweet is going to do if he's going to have showings or let me touch it, <laughs> you know, that's, that's less clear to me. How long would you say the clips are that, that are being um, recorded? Like for your pieces, are you thinking of full fledged shows that are never before seen or shorter clips, like one joke? Boy, that would be fun. One joke. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, every once in a while I'll record, I'll ask you guys, I'll record a podcast and it just goes sideways. And I'm just like, I have a podcast called You Made It Weird. It's very rare that I just won't gel with the guest or they seem to be in the wrong mood or their publicist uh, made them do it or something. And it just goes goofy and it goes bad. And I'm like, if it goes poor and I decide not to release it, you know what I like about the idea of selling it as an NFT is it takes something that would have been a waste that does have some value. Like, would you like to watch a train wreck? Would you like to listen to what I think is shitty? Like something that's not good, but in the way that, and I love the movie Showgirls, but Showgirls is not good. Would you like to enjoy this podcast and listen to me watch my energy dip and watch them sour and and at the end nobody likes anybody that so when i was introduced to nfts that's the one of the first thoughts i had was i was like well what don't i want to release but i'd be willing to commoditize because because you're sort of victimized by something going poorly and then you're like well let let's celebrate it and say would you like to buy a piece of shit because i actually think if you knew it was a piece of shit going in you would enjoy it and it would be novel because you'd go it's secret like pete didn't want to release this but i own it and i can release it would you like to hear this horrible thing uh i i like the again the creativity of that but to answer your question i think everybody's segment that i watched was about 15 minutes so i would imagine that that might get edited down to like 12 or so um but it was me and Moses Storm, who's another very funny comedian, and uh, he was hosting the night. And it was in conversation, which we thought made it even more novel. We're sort of talking with the crowd. We're going over bits that um, either we haven't done before because of the pandemic or just like don't always work. And there was like a real breaking down of the fourth wall to our segment. In my case, I did a joke that's usually too dirty, uh, that people don't want to see this youth pastor face talking about this topic but in that context under the the heightened stakes of this is an nft this is a property um made it more energized more funny and i hope more interesting for the eclectic billionaire that buys it i I totally want to buy your first non-fungible cringy podcast so put me first in line uh for that one it it sounds like even though it's sort of an early uh experiment you know this has freed you up a little bit maybe creatively and from the business side how do you think about this in terms of for your your followers or your fans you know how does this uh experience change for them and have you gotten feedback that people think you're crazy and not understand it or are there people that like totally get it what's that feel like well, what's interesting about uh, Bitcoin is it, it gave this like, um, it's not just legitimacy, it just gave mystery to things that we don't understand. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody was making fun of Bitcoin. And then it, I think that was sort of a necessary step uh, that might have even led to this sort of stuff. So people aren't as um, flagrant and blatant in like mocking this. My hope is this this might sound too lofty or maybe false, but it's like the reason why podcasts are, I think, a phenomenon is because entertainment is relational. Like I, I'm watching Ted Lasso right now, right? Everybody's watching Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso shows up in your house on Friday. He's a guest in your home. That show becomes a guest in your home. And that is a relationship. It's parasocial. Ted, Ted Lasso doesn't know he has a relationship with you. Podcasters don't know they have a relationship with you. But it's sort of like a synthetic, and that doesn't mean bad. It's an artificial, and that doesn't mean bad, uh, relationship. It, it gives you some of the nutrition of a, of a real-life human relationship. They stream right into your ears. That's very intimate. Like, it's just you and your friends. And they show up on a regular basis. Whereas stand-ups before podcasts used to just, like, might have a special every couple of years or might have a guest appearance on some TV show or might have a new show. It's erratic. What's that? That's a bad relationship. That's like a, a drunk dad or something. Like <laughs> where's, where's drunk dad? Like, Oh, I guess he taped something in Vegas that we can watch. That's not a good relationship. So a podcast says, Hey, I'll meet you every Wednesday. I'll meet you every Friday. So now we have a relationship. So one of the potentials I see with NFTs, hopefully in, in success would be, now you can be a participate a new a new way to participate in this relationship. You can be the owner of this piece, because you know we watch autographs become photographs, right? It used to be, will you sign my autograph book? And now 
Nobody wants an autograph. E even older people, nobody wants an autograph. They want a photograph. And maybe and I, I'll leave this to the the Philip K. Dicks out there. Like, I don't know what the future is going to be, but there's a possibility that NFTs, I think, are going to play a part in that. What is an NFT? Non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible is a term to describe things that can't be exchanged one for one with each other. There's been a lot of talk lately about digital artwork, collectible cards, and pictures of cartoon cats selling for thousands of dollars. The digital items both have completely different qualities and therefore different values. If you look at the demographic of crypto, uh, most people are kind of like geeky, nerdy, and they probably never get invited to prom. Great, so really excited for today's topic because I've been in this space for four years, flying around the world, trying to explain to people what NFTs are and what it means to collect them. And honestly, I'm not even sure I know. I've done Twitter polls and it's almost like dead even. But today we've got a bunch of sharp folks on and I'm really excited to hear what you guys think. Like, what is an NFT to you and what does it even mean to, to, to own an NFT or to collect one? I just wanted to say like back in 2018, 2019, also having a lot of conversations about what is an NFT. I start out by saying, this is a Jeep Wrangler and it just sold for $20,000. This is a Game Boss. It also just sold for $20,000. And trying to explain to people that we can have these collectible digital assets that you can own and what does that mean and look like. And then the digital assets like game assets is also a growing sector too. So if you take these two industries and you fuse them together, you basically get like the perfect storm. I got into digital collecting about five years ago. Back then when I was producing and making VR art, no one wants to collect them. And suddenly now, digital art become like everyone wants to collect it. And digital art been happening, you know, since like, you know, 60s, there are digital artists. But for me, it's really what's the utility behind the NFT? What type of value we're really talking about here? So are they purely speculative? Are these just flippers flipping or your NFT could potentially become a weapon in that you, you could use. I agree with that completely. What you're saying, Jenny, it's like, what does it mean kind of now? And what does it mean in the future? I think are two very, very different things. I mean, we're very early in this arc, although it's on the tips of everyone's tongues. I think something that is very interesting about non-fungible tokens is that there's going to be emergent utility of these I think as we start to mass adopted AR and VR, XR, whatever you want to call it, technologies, it's when we're really going to solidify the utility component of what an NFT is in a way that's tangible to like my parents. Before the early stage, you're just buying, right? You're buying this JPEG file. No one really gets it, but you're just buying people FOMO, get super FOMO. For instance, remember the ape thing that I got like... I was like, oh my God, I need to get in because everyone I know have an ape. It's like you have this golden ticket to that boat. People resonate, like the, the ape, people get bored, you know, in the crypto world, they are so rich. People used to debate in the old days, am I buying a token or am I buying the JPEG? What do I really own? And the conversation has shifted to, am I buying an experience or am I buying belonging to a subculture? So like the bored apes groups and even collecting punks, it's this thing that I'm kind of calling inclusive exclusivity. We want like, diverse groups where everybody has a shot at being part of it. But there's a part of us that always kind of wants to feel like we belong to something special, I think. I think it's kind of like diversity with a thread woven through it, right? Like there's a common interest. You know, as a kid that grew up on Zork and on pixel graphic games, some of these things to me are, are not just beautiful. They're like the most realized version of art just because I grew up on those kind of things. So I think that there's the, I love what you guys are saying. There's definitely this cultural through line of a thing, a shared interest that connects people that are interested in these things. And there is that kind of like clicky sort of a bit of a club kind of FOMO. It is an asset class, you know? My thing is really, really interesting. At the very beginning of the people thing, there's a huge friction between the traditional contemporary art world and this crypto world. Because if you look at the demographic of crypto, uh, most people are kind of like geeky, nerdy, and they probably never get invited to prom. 
And suddenly these people rising to power, you know, we are here now. It represents a certain attitude. It's very good market for so many creators to think about what this community is really about. What's this culture really about? You guys are right. It's just this natural progression of people. The first thing that people understand is the visual aesthetic. And it's just harder to walk down the path and understand abstractly that there's technology behind it. I'm seeing quite a bit of chatter about how we're in a bubble. And honestly, like maybe certain types of things are in a bubble, like, right. Maybe this idea of having all these avatar pictures with no utility. I think we're going to see that distributed across a lot of these different verticals that are still very early, like interactive NFTs. So anyways, that's my thought is that we're still in early days, but the first touch point for people is understanding art. It was the lowest hanging fruit. And then from there, we're adding, like we're iterating on that idea and walking the community through educational steps along the way. Yeah, I think that's a great way to close. So I think part of why so many different people are drawn into this space is because all the things haven't been solved yet, right? The definition isn't fully laid out yet. And we all sense that we can come in and help shape and form what NFTs could be. And that's why I think it's so exciting for so many people. Digital ownership. It's not just their inability to be mutually exchanged that makes them special. It's how they allow people to prove they own digital items. Before NFTs, it was difficult to sell things like digital artwork. Once a piece had been made public on the internet, anyone could copy it and say they had the original. It was also impossible to program royalties into digital pieces so the creator could take a percentage cut of sales each time the artwork was sold to a new owner. But now, it's entirely possible to prove you own something digital, set up automatic royalties, and sell virtual items thanks to the emergence of NFTs. <laughs> uh, the game never ends. <laughs> Bye. If you guys started glazing over or looking at your phone, <laughs> I would only sort of be uncomfortable. I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire! I'm not a millionaire. Crypto is complicated, but as a tax expert with crypto experience, you can hand your taxes off to me. You do your thing. We've got your taxes. Into it. TurboTax Live. <laughs>
I have so little. I'm not like you. I don't have family emerald mine money. Oh, well, well, Brenda, I, no one does. I, I think, actually, I'm coming back around to old Dogecoin, yeah. Yeah, Dogecoin rules. No! Why did I sell? My husband is going to be so mad. Oh, oh, oh well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't worry about him. What? What did you do? It, it's Mike. He said that he... Filed for divorce? Well, you shouldn't have sold Doge, Brenda. How do you have this power? And finally, we have uh, Trevor from uh, Miami, Florida. Um, hi, Trev. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, well, you look a little stressed. Please just tell me what to do. Should I buy Dogecoin? Should I sell? How does anyone win this game? Well, it's simple. You just do what I say. Okay. <laughs> so, pick up your phone and buy Dogecoin. It's simple. Yeah, that is simple. <laughs> okay. It is what an idiot does. <laughs> Fuck you, Mars. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Is, is that any way to talk to your father? What? No, oh, tell him, Helen. Mom? You married Elon Musk? I'm not sure how it happened. He's just so darn persuasive. No! Oh, well, looks like I'm the winner. Again, uh, thanks for tuning in to Elon Musk Messes With Your Reality, the only game show where, where I, uh, Elon Musk, am the only winner. But seriously, when will, when will you people learn? Scarcity. Another interesting thing about NFTs is they can be used to prove the rarity of something. When creating or minting NFTs, it's possible to include information about the scarcity of the unique asset or group of unique assets to which they're being linked. For example, you could create five limited edition digital items and store specific details of each piece into an NFT. This would allow you to show any prospective buyer or interested party the pieces are provably scarce. But why would someone pay thousands of dollars for an original when you could buy a perfect replica NFT for much less? Well, it's the same reason we buy anything rare or collectible. It's all about owning something original. Would you trade a vintage Andy Warhol painting for a cheap printed copy? Probably not. With this certain performance, it's it's a recorded like event, something you are already doing that's a part of your normal act. Have you thought about moving into more of a virtual experience? Like in the future, let's say you continue down this path where you're recording content, you're making it more like with the NFTs and the assets. Like, have you thought that far down the rabbit hole or like where are you in your thought process of your craft plus NFTs? Well, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to try to answer your question um, but when you say virtual, like the first thing that I think would work for virtual is what we're sort of already seeing on apps like Clubhouse. Is it, it's Clubhouse, like things where you can do essentially like virtual meet and greet. So like, I feel like the virtual space is really good for podcasts, stuff where like people are, uh, there's a time to ask questions and engage. Obviously, even I, I'm saying, even if you have like full Avengers style avatars, like translucent avatars of your bodies that I can see. Um, I, I'm, it's not that I'm skeptical. It's like stand up is so fragile. It, like, it's like doing surgery on a dolphin or something. And like you can lose the dolphin so quick. And as soon as like Wi Fi or internet speeds are involved or like people in different time zones or the lack of tension, like right now, there's less tension than if the three of us were in a room together. And I'm not saying bad tension. I'm saying there's mild tension here. Like if you guys started glazing over or looking at your phone, <laughs> I would only sort of be uncomfortable. But but the the live aspect of stand-up comedy runs on tension. Uh, that's That's what a setup is. It's like I'm going to allow for a time of not funny to actually make you sort of worried that it won't be funny. And then part of the laughter is actually a release of relief and a release of that tension. It's an expression of relief. So that's why I didn't do any Zoom shows. Uh, 
I'm also, you know, that's a fortunate thing to not have to do Zoom shows. But I didn't. I wasn't interested. It's sort of like playing guitar underwater or something. I can't be funny if you can turn me off. <laughs> I can't be funny if you feel completely comfortable to get up and go to the bathroom. I need you to sort of feel hostage at a comedy show. And that's why the best clubs in the, like the comedy cellar, right? It's a cellar. What makes you think of a, the first thing you think of a cellar is like sort of hard to get in and out. You have to duck your head reverently, like you're going into a chapel of comedy and you're stuck in there. The comedy is the feeling of being snowed in and there's no TV and there's no music. So one person stands up and says, I'll entertain you. That's what comedy is. It's a snowed in art form. And if you're just like not wearing pants and at any moment can bolt, I'm not hopeful for that. I'm hope meaning virtual reality stand up. Although I know there's some, there's already people doing it. I'm just going to be the old fogey. That's like, that's not, that doesn't feel right to me. It just feels like a little bit off. I don't know. It's like going to a McDonald's that's green and blue. It, it's supposed to be red and yellow. You know what I mean? It's just a little off. It might be pretty similar, but it's just a little off. To, it's, it's very off to me. But if there were virtual shows that people could go to, and then now we're in an interesting area, they could own not just, uh, say, my performance, they would own them. You know, it, it's it's like an, it's an extreme version of, of buying the photo of you going down the log flume, right? You could, but you could also be the only person that owns it. Could be interesting. You can also do like just on the aspect of of the tension being live. You could allow people to buy a ticket to a, a virtual show, right? So the NFT is and the metadata is just this ticket face, and then when the show is starting to be like you go live, now the live stream is actually coming through the NFT portal. So. Because of um, basically iframe support, you can stream stream live content. And so now the recording in real time is becoming the metadata of the NFT. So everything that's happening is going to be my moment of my NFT. And I don't know what it's going to be or how it's going to end. But then I could have captured this part of an interaction that I bought for I don't know how much money. Maybe it was a private show of 10 people. Um, And then at the conclusion, I have this piece of our history yeah, that's interesting. I love the idea that the portal is the NFT, like access to the show, because you're you're hitting it on the head. Like all of show business is like, I have, I have something in my hands. Would you like to see it? Like it has to be sort of like special, meaning we're really getting kind of philosophical here, but meaning is something we manufacture and specialness. That's why, you know, look at encores. Like when a band plays an encore, they're just standing in the wings they're not going in. They're not really going to leave. It's theater, but we like it. We w- And those songs are more special because we feel like we earn them with our clapping. So an NFT is sort of like clapping for an encore, but it might be something else. It might be money or it might be uh, bidding in some other way. But that it, whatever gets you through the night, you know, this is, we're, we're floating in space. So if something makes you feel special or feel involved or connected, uh, I'm for it. Because again, we're, f- we're floating in infinite blackness. I think what we need to do is figure out a way to lock people into the metaverse so they can't escape. Because if you can, what I learned here is that if you can escape, then it's not funny anymore, right? So we need to trap yeah. people in the metaverse, right? To, to well, what's, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, 100%. I would, that's where my brain went too. And I'm like, there, there would just have to be maybe an agreement that like once you're in, if you leave, you can't come back. Yep. And you know what that sounds like? That sounds like there's magic shows I've been to that, that have that heightened sense of like, once you leave, you can't come back. And what is that? That's ceremony. That's liturgy. That's literally something that mammals do to make things feel really, really special. And often it's that feeling of novelty that is the most entertaining part of the night, that feeling of like, we're a group and we're in this room and we can't leave. And if you leave, you can't come back. That's actually part of what you're paying for. It might seem rude, but it's actually a gift that they're giving you. So if there was something where it's like, you can't talk like, or you're or you're booted, like anything that gives it that sort of like, I don't need everybody wearing a robe and like bowing their head, like eyes wide shut, but I do need some stakes Otherwise, you know, it's just too low stakes. Comedy is also like being trapped in an elevator with somebody or being in a car with somebody. 
You need to be like, I'm locked into this. That's why the people in the front rows have the best time because they know if they get up and go to the bathroom, somebody, at least the performer is going to notice, maybe not make fun of you, but they're going to notice and you're going to change the show a little bit because you got up and that's what a standing ovation is. It's like, I know you can see us. I think we can do this. We should revoke the access token, right? People think of NFTs as access tokens. So, you know, if, if somebody leaves or goes early, they have to forfeit their NFT. You know, I think this could this could actually happen. Unless it'll, what if it leads to just more distraction because now people with diarrhea don't want to sign off. So we have to like watch some weird avatar I think go there and has take to, a big dump. There has to be a poop token out there already. I'm almost certain of it. So maybe that somehow you, you play your, your poop token and you can move on. I, what will be really interesting and it will really require, like, I think it's crazy that it's 2021 and, and we don't have the same level of intimacy that a landline telephone has. Like, this is pretty good. That to me would be a genius idea. Something that even though people are disparate and separated by time and space, maybe not time, but they're separated by space, something that could create the tension of like, but we're all on this bus together. I don't know what it would be, but that would be when I would stop flying around and just do virtual shows, but it would have to give like a congealed stuck feeling. But then another problem, and this, I'll talk about this all day. Like part of the fun of a show is watching the guy who, you know, must be head chickens for a living because he, he's just needed a laugh so badly. And you're watching someone almost have an exorcism because they're laughing so hard. And then their laughter is contagious to you. And, and you're laughing at the jokes, but you're also just laughing because you're in a group of people laughing. How do you manufacture that in real time? So in this, in this um, particular NFT that you're, you're, what are you dropping it soon or has it already dropped? I don't think it's dropped yet. Um, I don't, no, if we have like a board meeting, <laughs> I'm just kidding. They can drop it whenever they want. What a what a hoot. I'm going to use the word hoot it will be for me and Beth Stelling and Maria Bamford and everybody that did this. If it drops and it's huge, you're going to see a lot of comedians knees to nose, just <laughs> hut to in and rushing to do this. It'll be so funny if this I, and i'm completely open to it again that's the bitcoin of it all we don't know if this ends up being huge it would change the world so while today i'm like oh i don't know when it drops uh, i don't know when the bidding starts i don't know if this is enormous you're gonna see me next time we talk being like uh, it drops on september 1 at uh, 1 p.m and this is the website because everybody's gonna take it more seriously once it blows up but right now I'm in the I'm in the waiting room with a lot of other people. Well, thank you so much, Pete. I think we're at time. And um, from this conversation has been amazing learning about the craft, storytelling, all the way to Jason's idea of poop tokens. Um, <laughs> I really am excited to see where you can take this. It's neat that you are pioneering this uh, new vertical, essentially, in the NFT space. Well, I got to hand it to the, the people that started at Brandon and everybody, but um, I'm happy to be along for the ride. Thank you.